Gotta love it. Gotta love it. Hello, gatekeepers. Welcome in. Welcome in. This is crazy, man. That jazz just do 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 do. Hey, Blue, I see. I saw you in here. Ted, I think you were the first one in. AJK. Renice, hello, lovely. D-Rock, good to see you throwing in the emo emojis and uh, getting us going. It looked a little Halloween, but you know, it's Halloween all the time around here, right? That's right, right, Jack? Glenn, Glenn knows. How's everybody doing um, this week? Wow. Can you look back over a week and hey, <laughs> D-Rock, can you... Do I have an echo? Really? Oh, wait a minute. Let me see something. Hold on. Do, 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 do. Okay, that's not on. Hello, hello, hello. Can you hear me now? Is that any better? Oh, my gosh. wonder why. Hold on. Hold one second. Let me go in here in settings. Echo, 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 echo. Let's see how it's set up. Do, 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 do. Okay. Is that any better? Is that any better? If you've got an echo, let me know. They're saying 5-5. Five, five. No echo here. Okay, go out and come back in and see if that works. 5-5, five, five, first floor, same 5-5. Five, five. So go out, come back in. Uh, sometimes you can go up to, also if you're dragging, there's uh, three little dots. Hit those, go into your settings, and you can pick the quality. So maybe go from, what is it, uh, 1080 to 480 or something like that, 1040 to whatever. Go down one and then come back in, and sometimes that works. Case it's me. I'll refresh in case it's me. Okay. How's the waggy tails doing, Ted? Hey, and Edna, welcome in. AJK, I saw you in here and everybody else. So welcome. I hope this week was good for you. It was one of those, for me, it was just, you know, put your head down and keep going forward. How about you? I think that's what we're all doing, right? Don't forget to put your head up. Don't forget to do something for you. Have some hot tea. Hey, Blue, good to see you, sweetheart. I hope you're listening to music. What do you think of that jazz? I'm not really a jazz person either, but I had, you know, I had a little, you know, come on now. I know you were tapping your foot. What do you think, first floor? I mean, it just depends on the mood. And I think it's so cool the way music can put you in the mood. Like, darkness is coming. At Kevin MacLeod. Boom. And even looking back over our past couple episodes we were doing on the Sharks with Jaws. That whole thing. It, 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 I think it was um, Spielberg went in to hear the, the, what the composer had come up with. And he just hits the two notes. Boom, boom. Boom, boom. Maybe a little faster. Add a little more. But real slow. Give it time to breathe. And Spielberg said, is that it? And the guy said, yeah. That's it. Did it now. Yeah, it's got its place, doesn't it, AJK? Yep. I hope everybody had a great day. I'm going for the whole weekend. And we made it through. We must have did okay. Doesn't mean we're happy with every spot of it, but we're here. Right? We made it through another week. Did you gray man it this week? Did you just go in and, you know, just give me my bread and my, you know, whatever, you know, head of lettuce or ribeye, whatever you were grabbing, your oatmeal, your milled flaxseed, your, your vitamins, frozen peas, whatever it is you're going to grab. And just like, try, do not engage, do not engage, do not engage, do not engage. You know, don't, you know, you're, you, you're aware of everything around you, but you're not really making eye contact with anybody. Sometimes you do, and they're like doing the same thing. Have you ever had that happen? They're kind of, you know, they're keeping their head down, but they're totally aware of everything going on around, you know. You know, you like bop, Glenn? Bebop, like bebop? Like, you know, you know what I miss? And Edna will be right here with me. The old, I don't know if in the South, well, the, in the South had its own version of this, I think. But in the cities and, you know, growing up in New Jersey and all of the echoes of the subways and the bathrooms and the street corner crooners, you know, all the stars. 
out tonight. You know what I'm, well, you know, is that the kind of bop you're talking about, Glenn? But, man, that was, you know, you had your baritone. You had your your, your guy that was going for the, you know, he was up there. Sounded so good. Who didn't do that? You know, I know we were in choir. And uh, I was always in and out of music whenever, you know. I think at one time I was in the chamber choir. I was in the church choir. I was in the, um, I was in heavy metal rock band. And the uh, All-State Choir. It was uh, all at the same time. I only have eyes for you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, whew. you hear some of that stuff. You hear some of it in, in movies like Bronx Tale. Throw them out here if you know them, if you guys remember them. But all the different ones where they had a good sign from that. But, you know, again, it's interesting. I think about it, they had their a similar version in the South. You know, the front porch, back porch singers. You know, and the just guitar and the stars, you know. But you know, sometimes you got to look back at that, you know, because of the different moods it puts you in. Does anybody else have that where you hear an old song and you're just zapped just for a second, almost like a deja vu? The the more you focus on it, the faster it flits away. But it'll take you back for a second, you know. Anytime I ever hear "Let It Be." I think of that, you know, I'm like eight, nine, walking on the sidewalk barefoot, Belmar, New Jersey, transistor radio, had the white earphone that went in your ear, right, took me right, takes me right back, looking at the cracks, walking, probably going from my aunt's house to the house where I saw the snot hat, that's about how old I was when that happened, and I was so close, but I always went around the block. I talk about that in my book when I, hey, Melissa, welcome in. I talk about that in my book when I talk about the snot hag. It was incredible to me because we moved so much. It, it, maybe this has happened to some of you too. If you moved a lot as a kid, sometimes music, TV shows where the TV was in the living room or the way the living room was set up or whatever it may be, that's your timeline. Like, okay, I was in that house and that living room. You know, the black and white TV was over there, and that made me about third grade. You know, they all sing like they got kicked in the jaw. Yeah, they had hit the high notes. That, you know, that brings you back, Melissa, too, if you think about, you know, all the different, uh, yeah, gosh, I don't know why it made me think of it, but um, the Unix, you know, where they, they wanted them to keep their, their uh, lovely voice and didn't want their voices to change. So they, you know, how many different religions, the crap we do in the name of religion. Holy shit. Literally. Holy shit. Think about it. In the name of religion, the wars, the, 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 don't get me started. Don't get me. We probably don't want to go down there. We won't even get to haunted theaters. Think about it though. In the name of religion, both sides, you know, like Protestants and Catholics or stop it. Have we not learned anything? Who cares? I don't care if you pray to a, a, a you know, candle or a cell phone or, you know, bunny rabbit or whatever. I mean, if that's what and you're just peaceful and loving and you're just a little off. It's cool. Whatever floats your boat. Bang a gong, you know, light incense. Whatever. Follow the light. Love of God. Literally. There we go again. Anyhow. Holy shit. In the name of religion. How about in the name of love? You know? I mean, if you just focused on that and not my love's better than your love, my light's brighter than your light, you know, show me. Is that how you got through the week? Did you get mad? Did you want to break something? <laughs> did you want to flip off a car <laughs> did you did, were you shocked at a receipt you got this week for a bill i hope not don't be shocked expect it prepare for it overestimate overestimate your devastation and hope for the best think about it because i mean in certain cases things are coming so you know bills are higher gas is higher you know Jobs are shittier. People are shittier. 
They're losing their tempers. They're losing their shit. Everybody's batshit crazy. Oh, my God. It's so bad. You know? And you think about it. Are you walking around like you're going to grocery store or your office factory? Whatever it may be. Everybody's got such different lives. Even if you're a trucker on the roads, right? You see these things going in and out of the stores, going in and out of the diners, your normal stops, right? Or, you know, even your normal where you go get coffee and, and, you know, the hard roll or the, you know, the sausage biscuit, whatever you guys do in the morning, your normal stuff. You're seeing a difference, aren't you? Yep. Older music is the best. Well, doesn't every generation say that? 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, absolutely. We had it made in the 60s, 70s. I'm so proud. I stand with it and, uh, and multi many of you out there to stand by and say, I was there for barefoot, bell bottoms, long hair. The Levi's denim shirt did more for, for the 60s and 70s. Lord have mercy. Mm. You know, the puka beads. Stop it. The love beads, the, the music, the, you know. The flower kids. There was extremes on both sides. Hey, froze moment. There was extremes. There always is. But again, if you could gray man, did you gray man through the 60s? You know, you got in there, but just not enough to be one of the crazy loons, you know, jumping off of buildings or, you know, every generation's got its crazy stuff. We're highly trained. We made it through the 60s and 70s and 80s. This, you know, is this all you got? <laughs> right? I'm mean, serious. Right in, Edna? You know, I'm not asking for more and I'm not tempting fate. I'm just saying, you know, I've seen crazy before. I see these people coming out. I'm like, yeah, Alice Cooper did that. I said, Frank Zappa, you know, the riots of whatever. What time? Pick a time, you know, pick a protest. Who was that? Rebel without a cause, you know, what do you protest? What are you rebelling against? What do you got? You know, who was 100% murder, Jack? The music? The music today? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm sorry. You, ki you kids today with your hair and your music. Right? Yep. Concentrate on covering the generation of music I grew up. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, I think I missed a decade. That, uh, disco, it was funny because... If you look back at your collection when you were in high school, if that means cassettes, albums, eight tracks, you know, reel to reel, you know, whatever it was, just listen to the radio. You go all the way back and through all these shows that we've done, 1923s, and, you know, even looking back at Lizzie Borden's time and the Titanic stuff and going back and really looking through history like that, through all that, they had music. Even the axe man from New Orleans had music. He had his own, he's jazz. Da, 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 da. And you better believe after the word got out, New Orleans was hot with jazz. Am I right? Village of Sun, Frank Zappa. Look back at your collection that you had in high school. I was so eclectic because, again, as I stated, I was in, you know, brief for a brief time, all state. Uh, chamber choir, church choir, <laughs> uh, all kinds of music. I was in the band and, you know, the high school band and different instruments throughout time that less significant than the singing part. But anyhow, that goes to explain my eclectic collection. So I would have Simon and Garfunkel, um, Loggins and Messina, lots of Loggins and Messina, Meatloaf. Um, uh, Seals and Croft, Hamilton, Joe Frank, and Reynolds, you know. Um, and then I'd start getting into, you know, Moody Blues and, you know, branching out from there. And ACDC constantly, so that, you know, from one end to the other. And then joining the band, you, you, we got used to a lot of Judas Priest and, you know, Green Man Alicia with the two pound crown, you know, um, Bebop Deluxe, Tangerine Dream, um, 
harder early uh, Springsteen, like Adam raised a cane and different ones like that. I don't know if you're familiar, but anyway, top of my head. So at the same time, you know, it wasn't acid rock. It wasn't punk rock. It was rock. Some a little harder. I was never Iron Maiden. You know, I mean, I can only stand it for so long. You know, I drank a lot. I had a headache most of the time. You know, I was drinking Jack. So those are hangovers that, you know, aren't, aren't for the squeamish, you know. So I, I didn't, I, I wasn't really a head banger. But at the same time, you're trying to learn harmonies and, and, and different stuff like that. So did you guys do that? Did you have an eclectic? Um, different stuff that you got. Yeah, Erickson, the father of psychedelic Rocky Erickson and the 13th floor elevators. Man, that sounds familiar, but I can't really, you know what I mean? Pull anything up. I mean, Thin Lizzy, you know, I, the Thin Lizzy live, I wore that out. Um, you know, some who really wasn't feeling it. Um, Different, you know, different. I remember when the, the Sticks album came out, we had so, hey, Katina, thank you, sweetheart. Um, when uh, the lead singer went, uh, he went, you know, the nuts fell out of his tree, if you know what I mean. He just went, and, Wendy O. Williams, yes, absolutely, the plasmatics, absolutely. I remember her and her, her little electrical tape. She was just, you know, just sweet little thing up there on stage, wasn't she? She had that white, you know, platinum blonde hair just spiked all out. Her hair was so crazy. David Bowie went, hey, now, you know, how you doing? Yeah. But we, I saw so much stuff. I mean, at the same time, it's such a weird time because you could watch a show like American Bandstand or, um, oh, what is a Soul Train? And then uh, it was another one I can't remember. But you'd see them on there where they'd like lip sync and do kind of like the Archies and, you know, kind of just keep moving and lip sync to the song. But you could see people like, I don't know, like Donny Osmond and um, Donovan or you know, it's just some of these people with the big hair and the some of them had the scarf, you know, like Bobby Goldsboro, <laughs> crap like that. And um uh, Oh gosh, uh, 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 Engelbert Humperdinck, uh, Engelbert Slippy Bump. I bet you, is he related to that uh, Cumberbund young man? Maybe it's possible. Look that somebody look that up. See, so Engelbert Humperdinck and Peter Lemongello. <laughs> it's true. Um, wow, Neil Diamond, all at the same time. Lots of hair, big sideburns, polyester for days. Uh, bell bottoms. I didn't know any other shit. Just saying, they were out there. And at the same time, go to an Iron Maiden concert. It's just you had whiplash, you know, musical whiplash. And then there was the kids that were running around. You know, you had the, like the Ramones kind of crowd, where they were just, you know, like Ramones. And then you had like the Dead Boys crowd, where they were just, you know safety pin in their cheeks and sticking them through their nose and stuff and spiking her hair and beating each other up with bottles and all kinds of crazy crap. And I remember where you couldn't have any kind of liquor in, in, in uh, glass, everything had to go to paper cups and from New York, all the tri-state area. It just seemed like in the seventies for one point in time, because everybody was cutting everybody. It was crazy. Absolutely crazy. What are you saying, Jack? Patsy to Metallica from Patsy Klein to Metallica and WA Miles Davis. Yep. Everything in between except modern country and pop. Yep. Yep. I'll tell you what, some of that country stuff to, you know, some of it's all right. I had, to, I forced myself almost to watch that Tammy and uh, what's his face. George Jones. God. Is there anybody that ever has a happy uh, story? I guess they wouldn't make the book though, or write the, or do the movie. Beach Boys, Willie Nelson, and Missing Persons all in the same week. Just eclectic, right? Yep. I saw B-52's Talking Heads, Judas Priest, Iron Maiden Open Forum, and ZZ Top. I know it was in like the two weeks. And I probably saw Judas Priest one more time in there somewhere if it was two weeks. Because they were playing here like crazy Iggy Pop 
Never saw you pop. Saw Mata Hoople. Mata Hoople and Hunter. Ian Hunter. I was close, close, closer than I am to this, to Ian Hunter, because he came down the Paramount Theater. We found it. We found a connection. Paramount Theater, he came down the catwalk and he was right there with those big hair and his big sunglasses. Crazy. You know, Deep Purple, Rainbow, Richie Blackmore, Scorpions. Man, then you got your, your bands like Three Dog and the Three Dog Night, and uh, I almost said Three Dogs in the Night. <laughs> Is that from Barbershop? Um, wow, so many. I mean, you like Fog Hat and Foreigner, and yes, and you know, like I said, Moody Blues and all the different ones. But I never went and got their albums. The albums I got to to study either the singing style, the harmonies. Or just the music. And the ones I got for the music was. Uh, that changed with my general mood. But I can remember. I think it was like. Junior year maybe. And Styx came out. And everybody was looking forward to the new Styx album. And somebody got it. One of my boyfriends or something. And I put that on. That was the biggest bunch of trash I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Everyone Styx went. The, the lead singer for Styx. Mr. Roboto and all that mess. Went absolute nuts. Jerry Lee Lewis, student, yeah. What was Blue? Wild One, Real Wild One, yep. Ziggy Pop, yep. Yep, yep, yep. So many good things out there. And some of those B-sides stuff was so good, you know? I mean, I mean I'll, I'd mean, i be lying to you. I mean, I don't even want to talk about Springsteen right now. I'm not even... It's like somewhere and he, he just... He passed on. You know what I mean? But I can look back. Like Thunder Road, oh my God. Stop it. Sandy, 4th of July. I mean, that was all about what we were doing in the 70s and the early 80s out here. You know? Drag racing and hot rods and pink slips and, you know, dumb stuff. It was amazing. You know? I don't know what happened after that. Again, that shit crazy. Something's in the water besides fluoride. It's true. Uncommon. A lot of beast besides did show their true talent. Yep. Yep, Embers Lake and Palmer. Yes, yes, yes. Jefferson Airplane. Yep, not Starship Airplane. Absolutely. Saw them when they were, never saw them when they were Airplane. Saw them when they were Starship. Jane, Jane Tour. They came up here to Paramount and I was doing, one of the things to hang out with my girl. Oh, God, yeah. Absolutely, Ted. Um, you could almost tell exactly when it happened, too. I mean, I got stories, but anyway. So, um. What, shoot, what was I talking about? Who was it? Who was it? Who was it? Uh, oh, when he, um, yeah. Oh, Jefferson Airplane. Yeah, Starship. So Starship came up here. And I was at the time when I was hanging out with some of my, my friends. And uh, you could get into any concert if you didn't have tickets. You're like, hey, you know, what's, who's playing at the Paramount or who's playing at the uh, on the boardwalk tonight? And you'd find out, and they'd say, well, I didn't get tickets. Well, heck, here's the trucks. The roadies are coming. Let's get a bottle of Jack, roll a couple, and we'll be, you know, before you know it, you got a backstage pass. So we went up and we saw, no, 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 no. We had to jump in the truck. We had to jump in the uh, the bus with the guys. We were out looking for tambourines. That's what it was. And we kept drinking. God, back in the day. I can't believe I could do that stuff. I couldn't last five minutes now. Absolutely out of my mind. Anyway, looking for tambourines because the, the guy, I forget his name, who sang that song, Jane, and played lead guitar. He liked to throw them into the audience. So we spent all day with the roadies, got them drunk, got them stoned off their butts. <laughs> By the time the show came along, it was uh, it, it was quite something to watch them. Toto, I never saw Toto. I saw Sticks after Dennis, what's his face? But... No. Crazy. Lots and lots of memories. 70s was it, man. But I just think it was nuts. Like I said, the same time you could have Donnie Osmond and, you know, Partridge Family and stuff like that. Posters and D Young. Thank you. Dennis D Young. Absolutely blue. I, I mean, he went, bless his heart. I think he had a breakdown, didn't he? And, it, you know, he forced them to do that 
that whole kind of spinal tap thing. Did they come out of pods when they did Mr. Roboto? I know that spinal tap was kind of a a parody on that, that kind of mess, but they, they were dressed up in robot suits. Didn't they have that big old guitar player, that seven foot gargantuan guitar player? They got the little one and the big one, right? Taught little Tommy Shaw. You can put him in your pocket. And then they got that big gargantuan guy who plays guitar, right? Sweet Jane, Lou Reed, that's a whole different, yeah, Velvet Underground. That's that's a whole different realm, man. That's that's thinking music right there. Sweet Jane, oh God, I love that song. You know what else? I the Cure, only only one or two, but um, Paint It on Your Heart. God, if you have not heard that song by the Cure, man, that's a good tune. They played it all through Gone in sixty seconds, which wasn't a bad flick. With uh, um, Nick Cage and Angelina Jolie, old Brad Squeeze, are <laughs> constantly fighting in the God old world, right? Cheap Trick. I saw Cheap Trick. Uh, not long after the Live from Budokan album, it they were not bad. I mean. Bunny Carlos, you know, and uh, what's his face? The crazy one. He's amazing. Rick, uh, ooh, no, that was the uh, that was the singer. Or was they both? Or were they both named? They had the two pretty boys and two crazy ones. I actually did a write up in the art uh, art class on um, the Live and Budokan album. It was a trip. It's crazy stuff, man. A lot of Super Tramp, Take the Long Way Home. All that stuff was coming out. Yep, Joan Jett. Yeah, 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 yep. The Runaways, yeah, yeah, they were something. The Eagles, I mean, God, what a that they played on the soundtrack of our lives if you lived back then. I mean, it's just so constant, and you could see them all developing kind of like the Beatles did when they started out. They were all, you know, thin ties and polished shoes, and the next thing you know. <laughs> They go off in different directions, come back all screwed up. They go wearing moo moos and caftans and sitting on the floor and the white album. Explain that. I don't know. Anyway, music's a trip. Music is a trip. And that jazz in the beginning tonight was kind of cool. And um, yeah, I didn't mean to talk about music so long. We got on a little, little thing. But I do have a couple of things for you. We did mention the theater. Paramount Theater was where I saw most of those people here in beautiful downtown Asbury Park, New Jersey. So, um, yeah, God, so many. ZZ Top had to be one of the best. I it just I've never seen three individuals put out so much sound, clear, thumping. It was like watching a jet take off and you're on the runway and you just and it didn't stop and it was just tight and it was profound, you know, I mean, it was a trip. I think that's one of the most, one's most surprising, uh, that and Huey Lewis in the news, you wouldn't think it, but damn, those guys were good. They were well-practiced. They knew their stuff. Yep. And lover boy opened for him. And the whole time I was given the finger just front row center, that guy sweat so much. And when he shook his head, it he just sprayed the first three rows with his sweat. And he would run off after like every other song and blow dry his hair again. It was just get the hell off, you know? It was terrible. Yep. That was almost it was in a different place. That was in um what's now, I don't know, they changed the name depending on what bank buys the hall, right? You know, they changed the name so much, but that was in a different arena. But um uh, yeah, Huey Lewis and the news was good. I mean, they did all these little jumps and stuff, and they had all their timing down. You know, they they practiced a big time. They were something. They were quite the show. But um, different ones. I saw a lot of comics and and things like that. You know, um, but it was different. It was it was the little off things that I got to do. Like like I said, look around for tambourines for this Jane show, and then watch all the the roadies show up drunk and you know, it's just that they were terrible start when they changed their name to starship. It was a whole different, it was like when just leave it alone, just do what people want to hear what they've been listening to. But you know, I don't know. 
I guess you got to progress too, but I've never appreciated artists that, you know, I don't want to do that song again, even though it may, that's, that's the one everybody wants to hear. That's one that people have the memory with and they go, ah, I don't, you know, I'm not going to do it. And then they play a bunch of new stuff and just kind of, you know, the people that put them there. So it's rough, but anyway, haunted theaters, but um, but now the theater I'm talking about the Paramount and convention hall, which is right there next to it. Uh, the boardwalk and all that. We've actually talked about that on the show. Did a great show with Steve on that, the Morro castle and the Paramount and it being haunted. And they kept the, the Morro castle went down, I think in 1938, and um, it, it caught on fire. There was a lot of mystery to it. I'm doing it off the top of my head. So if I get any facts wrong, I apologize. But there was this mystery where there was some kind of row between the captain and the guy who was in charge of the electric, you know, could have had access to the electric and something else going on in that thing. Possibly started the fire. Captain was possibly poisoned. The whole thing caught on fire. It burnt like crazy. It was very Titanic-ish. Um, people said, why didn't you jump? Well, it was the equivalent of jumping out of like a, you know, six, seven-story building when you hit that water and stuff. And people were on fire. And it was, you know, you had your harrowing stories of the heroes trying to save these people in the water. And, you know, bodies washing up on the beach. And they put them all in the Paramount Theater. So, of course, that place is haunted as all get out. Um, they kept them there for a long time for uh, families to come from all over and people to come from all over to uh, try to identify the bodies. It was awful. Of course, they wanted to see the burning hull of the ship as well, which somehow washed up and crashed into the pier that is uh, connected to this Paramount Theater I'm talking about, which is why they took all the bodies in there and laid them on the stage and in among the chairs and in the back, you know, you know, back end and all. So that's not all that happened at the Paramount Theater in Asbury Park. Uh, there was another fire. There's stories of um, uh, families uh, seen like kind of huddled together in period clothing um, that possibly died in um, one of these uh, ships that didn't make it into Ellis Island because we're kind of right there as you go by on, you know, all these different immigrant ships and stuff coming through so much, so much history from moon wreckers, you know, waking kids up that are still, you know, what, if you dare fall asleep on the beach now, I don't, I wouldn't recommend it. Sleeping under the boardwalk, it kind of went out with the seventies, like the good music. But again, we had that too. So, and bonfires can't do that anymore either. God, isn't it terrible? Progress is so good for you, right? I am. I'm. I'm. I'm a little tired today. It's been a rough week, but I'm here, in Edna. So, anyhow, um, very haunted. Uh, I think it's real sad. You know, these clusters of immigrants, and they, they're not even understanding. They just kind of, you know, whether they died at sea or on the, the beach. But I think every coast has got those stories, right? But these theaters. Why do you think so many theaters are haunted? Is it the energy of crowds getting together and celebrating? I think that that's probably part of it. That's a big energy burst. It's usually, you know, even if it's a sad play, it's usually a, a decent energy. I don't think it's the same as a bunch of people going and seeing a movie. I think going to see a, a play, whether it's a high school play or something, um, you know, a professional production in one of these beautiful old theaters or I think even gathering in these I remember going uh it doesn't exist anymore again in Asbury Park it was the Paramount in Asbury Park and I saw what did I see with my mom the odd couple and Boatniks I think opened for it but odd couple was the draw Jack Lemon and um I see his face. Hit me, chat. Jack Lemon and the Odd Couple, the original. It's 
right there. I just can't get the name. But anyway, we went and saw that. And it was the theater like these. Like we're going to show some of these tonight. And then Steve and I are going to add some more on tonight, tomorrow night. And he's got some haunted theater stories he wanted to add in. So this is just a smattering around. And there's more. Uh, we might even be able to bring in uh, Walter Matthau. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Walter Matthau. I could see the M, but boy, I could. Ted's got it too. Yep. And uh, oh yeah, you know, if you're going to haunt some place, to be a theater for sure. Free music, people. Yeah, and you know, again, it's the energy and the people gathered. And you got to think if you were, if you had something to do with the theater, if you were a projectionist, if you were a, a, an actor, actress, if you were a stagehand, if you were art director. Uh, or just somebody who enjoyed the theater or somebody who started the building because they enjoyed it. You know, think about all that. But you have a lot of good energy, I think. And like I said, even with plays like um, the sad plays, I think you're still getting a better energy than you would, say, a bunch of people in a movie theater or a regular movie theater. It doesn't quite have that same atmosphere and feel. You know, there's not many left that's got like the red velvet curtains and the, the 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 gilded balconies and think ford's theater think all of that you know that gilding and and uh the drapery and the upholstery and the you know pomp and service hey vixen all of that you know i think that creates an atmosphere what do you guys think you know and and a draw i mean some of these stories tonight are sad because um, yeah, and don't quote Macbeth, very superstitious, you know, break a leg instead of good luck, um, all of those different things. But I think there's a lot of dreams and there's a lot of, like, look at the the um, lady who jumped off the Hollywood sign. Such a tragedy. You think about it. And, you know, there after they found her, a letter at her uh, at her home. One more day, you know, she was offered a, a, a big part. It just, you know, again, tragedies, you know, love lost, parts lost, um, you know, contracts, of, you know, people being taken advantage of, blackmail, the whole shebang. But in the theater, I think you have all that, but it's 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 the same but different. It's not the same as movies, you know, even though Peg Gant whistle, thank you, yes. Um, I just think, too that if you were of that and that was a big part of your life, that that would be a great draw or a great event like Ford's theater. We know that that's very haunted now, but for some reason when it was offices for, Oh, what 60 years, maybe I think it was. And then somebody decided to turn it back to theater. Then they started seeing people in the balconies and, and, you know, this kind of stuff. And right away they think it's Lincoln, but, you know, we talked here and we think it was more that it was Booth, possibly Lincoln in and out, but I, I doubt Lincoln would choose to, to, to be there stuck or anything like that. I don't believe that. I think it's, I think it's a Booth. I really do. But anyway, that's not here, there, nor there. So let's see. I've got a couple here. What do you think? You want to you want to hear a quick ghost story? Now I have to pay. Um, this is this is great. They're all over the theaters. There's no end to the ghost story at the haunted theater. And I picked out a couple for tonight because they seem to be real friendly towards people who wanted to go and uh, investigate. Um, a couple of these theaters will let you like at, they're still active. They have plays. They show movies. Uh, some of them do weddings, birthdays, uh, private um, showings of movies and things like that, which is kind of cool. They did that in Madison, Alabama. You could get the whole bar at a bar and you could have a birthday party and everybody watching a showing of a new movie together as a family or as a party, I guess. But interesting. But they also do paranormal investigations. And one of the things, one really good source on stuff like this, I know it sounds funny, but it's local news. Thank you, Uncommon Belief. Yeah. If you like the show and you want to support the show and you want me to help pay for the stream yard and the whatever, I don't have a, a, an office and I don't have a lot of employees or anything. In fact, that's me. So um, I appreciate that very much. 
And if you can't, just give it a thumbs up to help move past the YouTube algorithms or whatever. We cover a lot of stuff here. We cover a lot of nonsense, too. and We just jibber-jabber sometimes. But we do cover a lot of stuff that if you are serious about trying to peel back the layers of this paranormal onion, you'll find some gems in here. I promise you. And a lot of it comes from the chat and the guests and just these wonderful stories. But anyway, I think it's a good source because you always have those little shows like before Halloween or if new evidence pops up or somebody gets something that's noteworthy or whatever. Usually these little morning shows or local news will send out that reporter that always gets the, the weird and wonderful stories. And they don't do a bad job. They really, the ones on the, the scene will actually go in and and dig a little bit. Even if they're kind of tongue-in-cheek in it, where they're kind of making fun of it. Because when it gets back to the desk, they're always like, do you believe in ghosts, Harry? Ha, 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 ha. Yeah, I saw a UFO the other night. Ha, ha, ha. You know, they make fun of it. And you can kind of look at that like, you know, we're never going to win those people over. But we know that if something like that happened to them, right? They may blow it off or not even acknowledge it at all because they can't wrap their head around it. Or sometimes that changes their mind and they start looking at things like this and trying to sort it out like we are, you know, because that's pretty much it. So I think it's kind of neat. So I want to say thanks to all these different local TV stations and uh, in these little towns. Oh, Ted, thank you so much. Catnip and Funny Honey. Oh, you're so sweet, darling. We love you, gatekeepers. Thank you so much, sweetheart. So, um, thanks, honey. And thank you to the Waggy Tails as well. So, uh, like I said, there's no shortage to these things. And it's a great source. So I want to thank all the local TV stations and all these little towns with all these wonderful old theaters. And um, I think you're going to like it. So, let's start off with this one, shall we? It's a few minutes, but uh, we can talk through it if you want. If you want to put up your comments on it and you want to. Uh, there's one in here that's got a, a, a picture that I think you're going to really like. And it's a good story behind it, too. So let's see what we got. Do you see her? This man right here. Sorry, I had to go grab some more tea real quick. But this man right here, Chad Lawson, I'll tell you what happened. That's a good, clear picture of it. Okay, so he's a piano player. This this is an active theater, and uh, they have a lot of musicians that come in and out or whatever. This man is a piano player. In 2019, obviously, you see it here. This is when he posted on his Twitter, Twitter, whatever you would call it. He was there and he was taking pictures of the theater. And he took three consecutive snaps, pip, 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 you know, and I always recommend do that. And within it, here she is standing in the mezzanine right here. Can you see her? And she's, to me, it looks like she's got her hair behind one ear and she's got, got her head tilted. She's wearing some type of, I, you know, I, I hate saying period dress, but it's not of the time, you know, if you think about it. And in the first picture, she wasn't there. She's in the second picture, not in the third. Boop, boop, boop. And that one really shook him up and he posted it out. So credit goes to him. But it created enough of a stir that, of course, they put their cub reporter on there and uh, sent him out to uh, go and see what was going on at the theater. At the Paramount Theater, musicians are regular guests. 
but ghosts have lingered in the 104-year-old building. Two ghosts that have been with us for well over 50 years. Executive Director Jim Ritz says one of them is a woman in a white dress, always in the mezzanine heading toward the south wall of the theater. And what we believe the history is, is that next to the uh, Paramount Theater originally was the uh, War Department of the Republic of Texas. And the belief is that her husband had been a soldier who was missing and that she is constantly trying to get back over to the War Department to find out the fate of her husband. That phantom could be the woman that pianist Chad Lawson photographed when visiting Austin Sunday. Ritz says the second spirit is an elderly gentleman in the left opera box smoking a cigarette. And though we haven't seen him for a while, many of our folks over the past 10 years have s smelled the cigar smoke and the residue of cigars in that box. There is another very special. Thank you so much, Vixen. Though, look at this, everybody. Thank you so much, darling. It would be less without you guys. I'm telling you what. Even though I'm tired, I am here, and I know you guys are tired too. So we're just hanging out tonight. We're having a good time, and I appreciate you very much, darling. Thank you. Lots of love and light to you and to you, Ted, and to everybody out there for being here. Thank you. Spirit, and that's longtime projectionist Walter Norris, who died of a cardiac event here in 2000 and who always had a candy bar and soft drink. We've continued that tradition during our film season. And in fact, most recently, when we brought in our digital cinema package about three and a half years ago, we kept having problems in getting it installed and getting it to operate. And then one of our production people looked up and they went, oh my goodness, we don't have a soft drink or a candy bar up here. They went and they got one, and within three minutes, the digital cinema package was uh, was working perfectly. So, Walter... And as far... <laughs> well, okay, so the big question yeah. <laughs> here is, like, if the lady in the photo, obviously, is actually a ghost or not, so yeah. it could be a ghost, as was mentioned in my story, or it could also be an employee who was there watching the rehearsal. Yeah, I, I read a little bit about that, and they said that there was an employee working during that Don't time. Don't spoil it for everyone. Period. It's more fun to have the mystery. But I feel like you could easily confirm whether or not she was there wearing well, that kind the, of clothing. The guy that took that the photo time. said that he took um, three different photos, and the one before and after, like, simultaneously yeah. before that one. He did a quick... Right, and yeah. she wasn't there. Yeah, so, so probably not the worker. Yeah. We needed some ghostly. How about that? Thank you so much, Ann Edna. You guys are so sweet. You guys are so good to me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You made my night. Thank you. You know, all I want to do is keep doing this for you. Keep digging up ghost stories. And as long as we keep finding, we still find stuff to talk about, I'll be here. You know, imagine running out of something to talk about. How would that happen? What would that look like? All right, now we're going to Florida. Here we go. Theater's ghosts captured on camera. News for Jack's promotion manager, Chrissy Sellers, shot this video 10 years ago while working with local haunts. That's a Jacksonville show investigating spiritual phenomena, but she did not know what she had filmed until a week later. It sounded like the um, seat was moving a little. I think it kind of looks like he's waving at us, like he's like, hey. So, you know, he seems like a friendly ghost. Today, there remains plenty of theories about these haunted seats in the balcony, E1 and E2. And those two seats are right here, right? Those two seats are right there. You can go ahead and sit in one. So am I, am I supposed to be feeling something or experiencing something? Uh, uh, you know, I'll look, I'll sit right next to you. Yeah, and... please do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nothing, right? For uh, now. For now. Florida theater president Numa Saisalin sits in the seat he believes belongs to a ghost named Jay, a friendly ghost. I'm in the seat for Jay's guest. If this is all true, that he might have been a former building engineer and he selected the initial J because the current building engineer at that time was Joe Collier, who, uh, and Joe is still with us. Look Another at that theater. theater. Is the seat belongs to a man named Joseph Hilton, who was an organist at the theater at in the seats. 1920s when the theater first opened. He later died by suicide. The other ghost story comes from this room. This is the projection booth. A former worker was giving a tour to some school kids more than 20 years ago, and as soon as one kid asked if any ghosts were ever in here, 
the door slammed. <gasps> Over the years, plenty of visitors say they have had their own ghostly encounters, but Chrissy's video was the first to capture Jay, and as far as she has heard, the last. And people sit in them all the time. I don't, some people know that they're the ghost seats, and I'm, but I'm sure many people who sit there have no idea that they're sitting in the ghost seats, which we think of as J seats. You can believe what you want to believe. That's fine with me, because I'm that way too. Like, all I know is what I experienced and what I saw. It's up to you to decide. <laughs> Where are we going now? Where are we going? Capitol Theater has been a fixture in Salt Lake City since it opened in 1913. Originally part of the Orpheum Theater chain, its design was modern and was used as a vaudeville theater, but motion pictures quickly changed the market. In the 1920s, it was renovated to show movies and did so for many years. The for a theater at the time, it was incredibly safe from fire, boasting 30 exits, asbestos curtains, and fire sprinklers. But that didn't stop fires from happening. On July 4, 1949, a fire broke out in the basement of the theater. 600 patrons watching a Rita Hayworth double feature were whisked safely from the theater, while the assistant manager sent a pair of ushers, Herbert Schoenhart and 17-year-old Richard Duffin, to the basement to investigate the fire. They carried fire extinguishers and tried to put out the flames. Schoenhart went back up to report to the manager while Duffin stayed behind to fight the flames. While he was there, a pair of oxygen tanks in the basement exploded, trapping Duffin in the basement and making him the only casualty of the fire. Over the years, the Capitol Theater has become the home of live theater and ballet performances, but some claim the ghost of young Dickie Duffin still haunts the theater, unplugging extension cords, flickering lights, and slamming doors. Those door slammers. I swear it looks just like Crispy grabbed that handle. He's so cute. He's He's been working hard this week, too. So how about that? That's just like three little places all over, you know, and each of these theaters, not only are they beautiful and they go back, you know, uh, some of them with grand histories, all this ornate uh, architecture. Out here, it's more Art Nouveau. I don't know how it is where you guys are. And of course, people like... Ted and uh, our all our friends across the pond or in Canada, you know, what do you have old theaters in town? Are they trying to renovate them and keep them historically sound and having shows there? Um, it seems like there's a few here. Um, of course, the more you get into New York and of course, you know, in the cities, but um, we've lost so many good ones too. You know, if you've got one in your town, um, is there, are there people trying to keep it? Um, up. I mean, could you even have shows in big cities anymore like that in these beautiful theaters? I guess you'd have to have some severe security. But um, it seems like, you know, peppered throughout, uh, we have the Algonquin in Manasquan, which is not far from me. It's, very, it's just like one of the next two towns over, uh, kind of moving more towards Asbury Park up the, you know, more north from where I am. But uh, beautiful theater, very much like this small. Not too long ago, went and saw a beautiful uh, Christmas uh, show that they had was uh, orchestra. And uh, it wasn't something I did a lot, but man, it was nice. And the atmosphere was so nice. And it's different when you're doing something like that or watching something like a Christmas carol or watching a play, whatever it may be, you know. Um, it just seems to have an air of how things used to be but a little more sophistication where people are treating each other a little nicer too, which makes me wonder if it's the environment we've created as well. Instead of having things like that, where we dressed up and we tried to act right and excuse me, and we're able to sit in velvet seats and things and be quiet as performance was going on with respect and laugh, you know, but uh, hold, you know, have yourself in a social uh, kind of grace, I guess. 
um, maybe it's because all these stores are all bright and the places we go in the theaters, it's all about lights and laser lasers and uh, different things. Maybe it's a different agitated kind of atmosphere. I don't know. It's all about comfort and things like that instead of, you know, I don't know. It's just different. I'm wondering if we, I don't know. Oh, do we act like the atmosphere we're in or do we create the atmosphere that's around? I don't know. I just think we've lost something along the way. When you get rid of that kind of grace, maybe sitting around the table, having dinner, family dinner with no phones and or Sunday dinner, you know, whether it's picnic or it's it's different you know how do you hold on to those things i think you hold on you start by not letting them destroy history you know i think if even if you took a crowd today and had a play and went into a theater like this to a a, a, a decent play, i don't care what kind of play it would be any get your gun or hello dolly or guys and dolls for pete's sakes i don't know an opera I couldn't do an opera, but you know what I mean? I think you carry yourself different. Mm -hmm. Lost respect. Yeah. For ourselves and others and for our history and for these buildings. I mean, look at how gorgeous some of these theaters are. I mean, if I was a ghost, I wouldn't mind hanging out there and coming down and seeing somebody practice. We hear story after story of uh, there's one and I'm trying to get it for, for tomorrow night. And if I can't, maybe we'll, we'll extend it and we'll do some more because there's so many great theater legends and stories. Um, but it was an actress and I think she was, it was Romeo and Juliet. And of course there's young actors playing this part and it was the local drama club. It wasn't a big production and they actually have a picture of one of the ghosts that's, said to haunt there an actress who somehow died from a scaffolding accident or something fell on her perhaps something like that she caught on some something she died on stage anyway or soon after the injury from an accident and romeo and juliet are doing the course of the death scene and you can see behind them this Go, I mean, literally, you could see her the bun of her hair, everything, the dress flowing, and she just materializes behind them and kind of floats and hovers there for a moment. It's a clear, uh, misty picture, um, clear, misty, but interesting, you know, and it matches the pictures of these, uh, of, of her back in the day. It just blows your mind, and it's also so, so very sad you think about it but again i can think of worse places to haunt couldn't you i guess i just hope they're not sitting there suffering so let's i've got some more you ready for some more oh the storytelling yeah yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. absolutely froze tradition is more important than ever tradition of morals and kindness yep polish off those moral compasses people and of course the storytelling yep so important in tribal the storytelling and, you know, tell the, tell the one about the, you know, this, or they all have morals to them. They all have consequences. They're all kind of like little warning, cautionary tales, you know? Yep. Yep. So true. All right. Let's see where we're going next. What state are we going to next? I forget. I love that skeleton. It is ghost. <laughs> That's so good. That's got to be a video game or something. Vincent Price. Aww. Those were the days. Indiana. There's something about this. Here we go. It's just haunted. So the theater itself was built in 1940, and over the years it's been a big part of the community. But in like the 90s, it started to kind of fall into disrepair. So part of what you see now, it was in bad shape. They spent about 10 years renovating the theater, repainting it. From top to bottom, we have similar experiences just about every time we come here now. Some nights it's, it's more active than others. Lights flashing, doors opening, 
uh, voices, sounds. The men's bathroom faucet comes on by itself all the time. We've had three what I'll call entities that seem to kind of stand out here. One is what's been reported several times as the man in the trench coat and fedora. Some locals believe that it might be the original owner coming to make sure that we're taking good care of the theater. The other is the manager who, there was a manager who killed himself in 1968, not in the theater, but some believe, based on some of the interactions we've had, that it might be his spirit returning. And the last one is a kid. One group came in out of Chicago, and they put their camera up next to our camera. And they sent me the video and audio later, and they said, you know, what do you think this is? And just clearly a kid saying, Mom. So I'm like, okay, well, let's see if they were tricking us or not. So I play back our camera. I don't hear Mom, but I hear Mom at the same time. So an EVP is an electro electronic voice phenomena. So it's basically capturing something that you and I might not hear, but you hear it on a recorder when you play it back. One group come in and they picked up a lot of voices, but one, they were upstairs and they said, or were you a projectionist here? Nothing happened. They said, what was your name? Nothing happened. They played it back and they heard Russ. If your name isn't Lucas, then what is your name? Russ. Well, I post that up on Facebook and I got a message immediately from someone who is the daughter of a projectionist, the original owner, whose father's name was Russ. One of my favorite stories. So we were having a board meeting. We were all up front here. It's all the board members, about six or seven of us. And we're, tr we're debating on what to have as a Christmas movie. So the debate wasn't so much what to have as was Die Hard a Christmas movie or not. So as soon as we said, yeah, we think it's a Christmas movie, we should show it, the lights on the side turned green and the spotlights came on. So whoever was here was approving Die Hard as a Christmas movie. No ghost has come up and tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, Dwight, I'm here. But enough weird stuff has happened to make you go, what the heck was that? Isn't it funny that he automatically jumps to the conclusion that the lights are going on and off because the ghost believes that Die Hard is a Christmas movie? What if they? What if the ghost was flashing them on and off, you know, and it was somebody like, I don't know, uh, Henry Fonda or something, you know, that kind of a character would say, no, the, you know, that's not a Christmas movie. You know, a Christmas movie is more like my time or whatever. How do you jump to conclusions like that? Do you see how these things start? You know, it's like, well, we said, so the ghost agreed with us. Well, how do you know that? That's the kind of stuff that I go, hmm, what do you guys think? Yeah. I know a lot of people do. My sister says the Christmas movie. Again, you know, whether it is or isn't, the thing is, is why do they jump to conclusions? Why do they jump to con conclusions that it's John who fell off the ladder, you know, back in the day? When it's really, you know, Jim who died in a car accident, you know, and he's just drawn to the energy. I'm just saying, you know, maybe we shouldn't jump to the narrative. Let the let the ghost tell because ghosts seem to take such a long time to get it out. You know, what what do you want? What's going down? What's your issue? Where are you at? You know, what do you see? What do you think you see? That's a lot to sort. Right. I mean, just like, like just like we said with the Ford's Theater, again, there was no activity. Now, that was a bombastic thing. People in the crowd were changed for life. Nothing was the same for those people after whether whether you saw something, whether you were right there or whether you were, you know, cleaning the windows at the back of the building, you were there. Right. And the minute they see some kind of activity in that balcony, they just right away assume and start putting out all these books and all these stories and everything else that Lincoln's ghost is hanging out in the balcony at the Ford's theater. It, it, possible. You know, to tell you the truth, it could be the, you know, the guy who was first there and held him while he died. And that's his traumatic moment. I mean, it could be, we shouldn't just jump to conclusions. You, you see what I'm saying? Because then you're not going to learn anything and you're not going to sort it. And if you are you can't sort it as a living person or a living group of people working together with the right intent to try to help sort it, then how is the ghost going to, you know what I mean? And are you there to help the ghost? Or if the ghost wants help, are you there to do that? Are you willing to do that? Or are you just there getting, you know, knock three times on the ceiling if you 
you know, want me. Twice on the pipes if the answer is no. <laughs> Tony Orlando and Dawn, we forgot them. But the Fowlers, pretty play. Look at the outside. It doesn't it doesn't look like you know, great grand thing, but man, I'll tell you inside something well, totally Fowler different Theater shows new movies every Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And they also allow open paranormal investigations. I thought that if was like pretty to cool. See more spooky stories from our area. You can click on the story on WLFI.com to find our haunted Lafayette series from previous years. Uh, certainly an eerie feel. I love this little guy. Don't you love him? Spooky, I wouldn't want to bump into him in a dark alley, but, you know, mad respect. Where are we going now? Tennessee. Look at that. Look at that old building. The Bijou. Thousands of people have walked these floors for more than 200 years. With history, I guess, comes uh, hauntings and residual spirits and energies. If walls could talk, you would hear stories of people who lived and died here when it was a hotel, a brothel, even a civil war hospital. It did treat both sides of the war. So sadly, a lot of people took their last breaths in these, in this building, in these floors, and in these walls. Courtney Bergmeier with Abijou says one of the most famous people to die here was General William Sanders. His story is commemorated on this plaque, but some might say his story is far from over. People say that they catch glimpses of a, of a, of a soldier and the gleam of his buttons and th around the corner of his eyes. So we have to assume that that's General Sanders keeping an eye on things. I don't know why I love that. I got to stop it right there. But how many of you love that part with the gleam of his buttons? I mean, I just love that. And I mean, it's legit, right? I mean, that's a, a great, I mean, it could be, I'm not saying anything about it's not him or anything like that. I'm saying, oh my gosh, thank you so much, Kathleen. Look at you. You guys are so kind to me. Thank you so much. You know, this is what I'm saying. You know, all of us together creating this spot. We're going to be here no matter what kind of week we had or month and uh, just keep going and keep the light going and try to learn about this and learn from each other. Thank you so much, gatekeepers. You guys are just the absolute best, honestly, you know, just your encouragement, the way you talk to each other in here, the way you throw stuff out, you know, to help to finish the story because my mind is blank after the week I've had and can't come up with names. We finish it. We could... I have it. We complete each other. You know what I'm saying? It takes a village sometimes. At the end of the week, we have to come in here and sort this together and just finish each other's sentences and fill in all the blanks and try to sort. It's wonderful. You know, we got to lift each other up. That's that, God bless it. God bless it. That's it right there. Absolutely. And I've got some things coming in the future for you. But again, I'm taking my time because I'm trying to sort life. A gray man through this shit. I'm telling you, it's not easy. It's like, I'm not fit for company. Don't talk to me. I know I can't hold my mouth. I know I'm going to say something. I know don't, don't do it. Don't do it. Oh, here they come. You know, it's like, it's like that little buddy. Look at this motherfucker here. Here they come. Oh, geez. You know, <laughs> just being honest. It's hard. It's hard to keep your light on when you're a candle in the wind, you know, think about it. It's like there's only so many matches left. <laughs> Hello, Sarah. You're trying to keep your candle lit or whatever. Whew, baby, I'm telling you, you guys light up. You know, we light each other's lights up. No, what was, who is that? That's also at the same time. I went, <laughs> memory, I went to uh, driving home from an Iron Maiden concert. God knows how many times that summer. Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, that heavy rock. And you know your ears buzz uh, for a while. I mean, it's just, it's, I mean, they're bringing Harleys on the stage. I mean, it's, it's Marshall Stacks. If you've never experienced Marshall Stacks, you know. We get in the car, turn on the radio, and it's halfway through Debbie Boone, you light up my life. And I remember the whole car just got real quiet and looked at each other and just like kind of laughed and the dude. You know those little push buttons you change your station? 
anyway, memories. Okay, back to the uh, the guy and his glistening buttons. I just thought that was kind of cool the way they said that. Of, uh, of, a, of a soldier and the gleam of his buttons and th around the corner of his eyes. So we have to assume that that's General Sanders. Keeping an eye on things. And it seems like General Sanders may not be alone. A paranormal investigative team deemed the women's restroom right off the gallery on the second floor is the most haunted place in the building. And some workers, well, they tend to agree. I was wearing a sweater, a cardigan, and as I was walking in, I felt two distinct tugs on the hem of my sweater. So I was here myself, and I was new, and just kind of convinced myself that it was nothing and it was all in my head. We have this theory that maybe it's a child, maybe it's a little kid or someone trying to get your attention. And apparently the stage area at the beach. I gotta admit, I like this girl. You know, she's bright, cheery, not a nice smile. She has a good attitude about things, you know, the gleam of his button in the corner of his eye, the whites of his eyes or whatever. Very nice. I like her. She's got that upbeat kind of, you know, but again, here we are with bathrooms, right? Is it the water? Is it just that there's more things that you can do in the bathroom that you figured out how to do as a ghost? You can turn the water on and off and bang doors. You know, Steve uh, Stockton's got a good uh, <laughs> good bathroom story. <laughs> I have to tell him that tomorrow. But he does. And it, it was very complex. You know, I was, I was kind of, you know, there live for it, even though I was, you know, thousands of miles away. Because he would tell me, he would call me, and we would talk about these things as, as they unfolded. But even just seeing the the polished shoes and the the, the suit uh, pant leg um, with a cuff in it, you know, this gray, you, you, know, you know, as a man, he could tell, um, just like a woman can tell by looking at the hem of a, a dress and the cut of it and where the waist is, you know, what decade it was probably from. Think about it, you know. You could do that with suits as well. And this he placed them right in that time when they were going through the, the trouble at the uh, this bank building or whatever it was. And this guy that committed suicide, he un had to unpeel it from, you know, backwards. Uh, very interesting story. We'll see if we can get it. Uh, it's not a theater, but um, bath bathroom ghost story. But it seems so creepy because I think, one, you're, you're more vulnerable. Things echo. Um, you know, you got to think about how creepy that is. You're in that, you're in the bathroom, you're doing whatever you're doing, you know, you're hovering, you're, 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 you're whatever. And you're just trying to get to, you're trying not to touch anything, you know, and here comes the bathroom door opens. You hear the footsteps, the, maybe the clink of the high heels or the, you know, the, the, the clank of, 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 of the shoes, you know, might be patent leather shoes, whatever guys are wearing. Because back in the day, there was very little sneakers. But anyhow. And you, you hear that. And it echoes that clank, clank, clank of the, the steps. And maybe you see something walk by. Maybe you don't. But maybe you hear the water turn on. Or maybe you hear the a next another stall door open and close. You know. And then you get up and you leave. And there's nobody there. This happened to Steve. Has it happened to you? More than once, if I remember correctly. But anyway, water, does it have anything to do with it? Or is there just more things in there that they can manipulate to get, to, to get attention or to scare you? Maybe that's all they're trying to do. Maybe they're just one of those that realize that when they do that, they get a burst of energy. I don't know. Lots of questions. I don't have any answers. Jew is not off limits. An overnight security guard told workers here the spirits are a little overactive at night. He heard footsteps all night long, kind of walking along the rafters and the catwalk up above on stage. And even performers have left the Bijou with some questions about movement in a closed off balcony that hasn't been used in decades. He came out to me and he said, is someone else in there? And I was like, nope, you're, I just got here. I literally just opened the door and let you in. And he was just like, well, I heard someone coughing. I was like, really? He's like, yeah, I heard someone coughing and I, I heard someone talking and it was coming from the back of the theater up high. And I was like, well, it sounds like you just encountered the Bijou ghost. And while we know not everyone is a believer in spirits. It this one here is a cheeky little monkey. Watch what she's going to do next. It I just. Never mind. Just watch. It is pretty clear that some eerie things happen here at the Bijou. And maybe 
Just maybe if you spend enough time here, you might experience something as well. I think it's only natural that their energy exists here somewhere or people are drawn back to this space. Look how pretty that is. Isn't that nice? Scary Grant likes it. Oh, look. It's the Warner Brothers and their sister Dot. Memphis, Tennessee. Going back to Tennessee. <laughs> the Orpheum. Look at the front of that. Look at that marquee. Look at that. Red velvet curtains. Look at that. Amazing. Jewel downtown Memphis, the Orpheum. It's the home of Broadway on Beale and a few permanent residents. This is no Phantom of the Opera, but our very own Phantom of the Orpheum. This is pretty we good. We have been told we have seven spirits that stay in the Orpheum. Mary, of course, is our primary spiritual resident. The story has it she was coming to the Orpheum and was hit by a streetcar out front and died. Local records line up with the story of a 12-year-old girl struck by a streetcar in front of the theater in 1928. Her body never identified or claimed, but she was not forgotten or unmourned. The entire Orpheum staff allegedly attended her funeral. And we'd heard tales about a little girl that had been seen in the theater. And she was described as uh, a girl about 12 years old. And this, lady and ladies and gentlemen, is why you love Tennessee and places like Memphis, where the history and the characters, like this gentleman, is probably a lovely man to sit down and have a drink with, have tell stories. But do you hear, see how he's carrying himself and how he speaks? This is very, if you're not familiar, very Savannah very uh georgia memphis um the magnolia states the peach states and things like that there are characters like even charleston you know south carolina and you'll have those the gentlemen with the canes and the and the straw hats still and, and things like that. it's 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 a trip it, it's similar to when you go to a place like new orleans new orleans new orleans you know and you've got the jazz and the crawfish and the people dancing in the streets and the way they do the, the different cultures. It's amazing, you know, but I love this guy's accent and, um, you know, with long the characters braids, of it. In a white short dress with black stockings, anything that is manifest. Look at that mezzanine. Look at that. It's been seen when it was quiet. Most of the time when people are not looking very hard, it's very special if you see a little girl in white. <laughs> As Brett was so saying, true, Aunt Anna. Is known as Mary C. Housewife. She stopped in to say hello, or maybe move over. Look at that. There what do you no think? No changes, nor was this seen on camera during filming. Even the Orpheum staff was shocked when they saw this bright yellow orb come in over his left shoulder and attempt to nudge him out of her seat as he was describing the location of her favorite spot in the house, C5, in the box stage left. Gosh, how long those chairs been there. So what do you think about that? Did you guys see that? Now, is this like a sunspot? Is it something reflecting off of something? Are you seeing it coming in? Here's our friend again. Why? Watch it again. As Brett was being interviewed in what is known as Mary's seat, she stopped into. Is it a reflection oh, off the move over. camera no lens? Lighting changes, nor was this seen on camera during filming. You know, like a, when I take, my, of course, when we've got Spirit and Boo and Helen, Helen Wheels, Spirit and Boo the names from my animals but the laser if i put it could be ted but again we don't know but if i hit like a mirror or reflective surface it's like a pink floyd concert there's lasers all over the place so is it like possible reflection off the you know the lens of the camera and picking up like these lights off of the off of coming off the balcony and off these aisles here and off the walls i don't know but uh yellow and the yellow orb, I doubt, I don't think she's trying to push him out of the seat. But do you see how they add stuff? Isn't that funny? It's like, you know, there's a yellow orb here. We don't know what it is. It could be a reflection. We looked around. These are, we tried to debunk it or whatever word you want to use. And, um, you know, explain it away. Uh, but we can't find any reason. What do you think? It is too, it, you know, again, it could be 
I was thinking the same thing, Jack. It's too yellow to be a reflection. But the light behind his head, I think it has almost has like a real overcast gold yellow glow to it. I'm not sure if I if I saw it here or when he was talking earlier. See that behind him? I don't know. I think you're right. I think that's way too yellow. Look at that's almost like chartreuse. And I have seen mists in my own eyes, my own camera, my own picture. I have seen a mist that I know I wasn't responsible for. At least I didn't fake it. That was almost hot pink in places. Like you could tell the energy was concentrated and then kind of went out wispy. And of course it got lighter pink, but the center and parts of it, very dark, misty pink, very clustered thicker and um i think it's possible and i have seen different colored orbs not often but i have seen them and purple like tiny purple sparkles in certain manifestations so i can't say it's not possible i don't know very interesting though it's very neon yes renise it's very neon Brett was being interviewed in what is known as mary's seat she stopped in to but say see, hello or maybe move over see to me the reason, I, I, this, again, this is weird and I'm like, you know, I'm no more scientific, you know, but when it moves, I, I can see it moving like from the white of his sleeve to the darker gray of his suit jacket. And when it moves away and has the background of this wood um, ornate uh, pew here, or whatever you want to call it, wall, walkway. It seems to disappear. It seems something that would be so strong that would show up. That yellow there would have some kind of substance when it gets over here. Watch what I mean. Very seat. She See how it just kind of or maybe move over disappears no off. I don't know. Nor was a scene on camera during. You filming. can see it move. Even the Orpheum staff was shocked when they saw this bright yellow orb come in over his left shoulder and it's very to circular out of her seat as he was describing the location of her favorite spot. Interesting. In C5 in the box stage left. When Annie was here, the original yeah. of Annie. You're uh, probably right, a very Jack. Large dollhouse that Daddy I Wilcox don't know. Gives to Annie as a Christmas present. This and is it was good. Heavy, it was hard to move, and it was always backstage. The stagehands came in for the show one night, and the, and the dollhouse wasn't there. They couldn't find it, just was nowhere to be found. And finally, it was found up here in the balcony. Uh, what? No one knows how I got there. <laughs> She's even been seen running and dancing in the aisles and balconies, sometimes, but rarely, even making her way to the stage, as seen in this photo. Look at there. There's a scene when Annie escapes from the orphanage in the big laundry basket, and the girl playing Annie is in the laundry basket, and someone spoke to her that she thinks was Mary. <laughs> Could be. Just like any young girl her age, yeah. she's just a playful trickster. There was a story of a man who was here to uh, fix the organ. He went across the street to get a cup of coffee, and he came back, and his tools were missing, and he eventually found them in a toilet. <laughs> How about that? Mary's a lover of theater, but the organ is her favorite Another song. mask. Her favorite song, Never Never Land from Peter Pan, which makes sense. The lyrics speak to someone in her position, where time is never being planned, and we're never growing old. Those brushes on that on that uh, snare, nice, isn't it? Yep. At ease, jammy jam, soul of mine. And the other song was Sir Cubworth murder mystery there's our little ghost again wasn't that nice give those brushes just yep right in the toilet sarah <laughs> look at that casablanca i love popcorn so much thanks to pixie bay tenor and youtube audio library for this lovely music and thank you mostly to the ghosts isn't that lovely isn't that lovely? Lovely music. Yep. So there you go. Um, let's see what time it is. Yeah, we got time for the last one. So 
I just think it's very interesting. All these lovely little uh, and these little hidden gems with these local news stations going down. And yeah, they make fun. And you've got uh, Susie Cream Cheese, whatever her name is there doing. She's pretending she's a ghost. And, you know, they probably worked on that for a week. God bless her. She's trying, you know, and uh, they laugh and they make fun. But some evidence and stories that get out on this have really done us a lot of good, just like trying to save this historical things. Like I want to get Michael Lachiana. He's been visiting lighthouses and museums and, you know, um, historical homesteads and, and different things. I mean, he's just constantly going. I absolutely love him and his crew and, you know, all these wonderful uh, people that go out and get great, great evidence and learn the story and the history too. But also trying to keep these things going. I mean, if I could have found a way to save the Paramount, I can remember, I mean, I was a kid, you know, but I remember my mom talking about it. That's why we went and saw that movie. That's why we went and saw, um, it was back in the day where that was a big deal for her to take me to a movie theater. I mean, I think I saw the odd couple with, I said like the boat next, I just kind of remember there's a lot of people in boats and things like that, but I definitely remember, it was like a Disney. It was funny. I think, you know, a bunch of comedians. It was a spoof, whatever. But I remember the odd couple. I remember sitting in that theater, looking up at that big screen and seeing uh, Walter Mouth uh, throw the spaghetti uh, against the wall and uh, Jack Lemon and how wonderful he was. It was, hey, hey, you know, <laughs> different things. And is, you know, tr making. Uh, Walter Matthau's character, Oscar, just absolutely loses his mind. And, you know, Murray and the poker game. And I, I remember all that stuff. You know, there wasn't too many times my mom had to cover my eyes. I remember, um, I can't remember what it was we went and saw. And, and she did. I think it was Billy Jack. She tried to cover my eyes. I, I can understand why. But, uh, you know, it was those times. It was just getting out of the 60s, just early into the 70s. And we were losing so many of these old, wonderful theaters. And I'm just glad that I found this plethora of stories. I've got a bunch more. I'm going to show some more tomorrow night um, on these little uh, newscasts where they go out. And, you I mean, I guess my point is, is they might be doing it tongue in cheek and they might be saying, okay, well, we've got this you know, you could see the crew maybe go like, ah, oh, geez, we got to go do that. I mean, this is crazy. And these people, but man, a door slams, they jump, right? You know, so it, it's, it's still, I guess, accidentally gives us a lot of good stories, gives us history, and it gives us um, some evidence, you know, because uh, one of the best uh, stories, and I can tell more about it tomorrow night, but EVP, and I've told it before on the, the show, where Richard Sennett was involved. He was the consultant that the, that the news crew was talking to. They went to the Waverly. He told her to keep a, a recorder running because at the Waverly, you're always getting these uh, sounds, uh, you know, different things, music boxes that aren't there and piano playing and things like that. The piano is not there or nobody's at the piano, all these different stories. She did it. She came back. She got this sound she couldn't explain turned out to be pool it sounded like somebody playing pool well she took it to the news crew to the sound guy he was into it he's trying to figure it out and he went the extra step now this is what a good investigation it's like you know the same you would you know reverse engineer a murder you know i think that's why we're always so interested in it's not the murder we're interested in it's the it's the how the why how do we sort it who did it how do we prove who did it same as a mystery. I think ghost, a lot of the ghost stories are mysteries too. You know, it's all same category. Really, if you look at it. So it gives us that. And I think quite accidentally in a lot of ways, because you could tell when they go back to the news crew or whatever, it's like, oh gosh, we got, you know, ooh, yeah. Go spend the night there, you son of a bitch. See what happens. See who runs. And we've had that. We've seen and some of these wonderful shows like Ghostly Encounters and um, My Paranormal Story and all this different stuff or celebrity ghost stories <coughs> where news crews have gone. Like that time when 
they went on that uh that ship in australia i think it was and they were making fun of it and they're doing a live radio show for halloween around it playing ghostbusters and all that stuff and henry the ghost didn't wasn't having it and all these things happen and news crews radio shows that were in haunted buildings and saw that woman walk by and that one woman's face changing that was extraordinary the um uh, australian kind of believe it or not show but i mean so many different things accidentally getting getting evidence when you're in there making fun of it but we've seen a couple of people change their change their thoughts on it so i got one more story uh this is a ghostly encounter it's about six minutes long and then we're out of here and i'll see you tomorrow night with steve we're going to do this again do some more of this but uh, thank you to the news crews that accidentally got us good stories and helping to preserve history. Um, and thank you to the, the groups that go in there, too. There's a lot of these theaters that will let you. Um, I thought it was so cute on some of their websites where they said, well, you know, paranormal groups that are coming in that are staying in for the night have to wait till the after, you know, 20 minutes so we can clean up after the last showing of the movie or the play or whatever it is. And they're very accommodating. And there's a lot of downtown places doing this too. Like look at Gettysburg and Farnsworth and all these different places you can stay in a haunted place and respectfully um, try to get evidence and stuff like that. And I got to say, I like that a whole lot more than going into a murder house, like Axe Murder House or something like that. This, this is a lot lighter to me. And, um, you know, no less tragedy to people that died in fires in theaters. We've all heard about that. The Iroquois, when we did Chicago, I talked a lot about those and, you know, how that changed so many safety features and things, asbestos curtains. And, you know, their theaters back then were boasting that they were fireproof because there's so many people packed in the same place. That was unusual in these early, early, uh, you know, states and these towns coming up and, We've heard a lot about that and um, they didn't quite know how to handle it. And, you know, like the Iroquois theater in Chicago, when it burnt down, so many people died and it was so many mistakes made doors that opened the wrong way and signs that were covered up because they wanted the aesthetics of the, the, uh, you know, the ambiance instead of the safety. Um, and uh, from the Iroquois fire, which is extremely haunted, the Iroquois theater, um, I would say even the streets around it, but um, even the push bar where how many people have worked in uh, office buildings, whatever, you're so used to it. Now you see that bar and you push and the door just opens. That stemmed out of the Iroquois Theater um, fire. It was early 20s, I think. We could be wrong on that, maybe a little earlier. And um, that all stemmed from that because it was so many safety features it should have had and so many things they did wrong and they learned from that. But often tragedy, right? is a great teacher. Look at the Titanic. They opted to take those uh, lifeboats off to make the deck look better. So they'd have a better promenade for the rich to walk around and walk their little French poodles or whatever it was the fad back then. But uh, Lassie, the love of Benji, Fantasia, lots of Disney movies. Oh yeah. I can remember going with my sister to see um, at the drive-in with my nieces and F or nieces sit in the back of an old Cadillac went to the drive-thru and we had a baby mattress in the back in our PJs. We had popcorn and we watched the Nutty Professor and the Shaggy DA maybe, or maybe it was a love bug. It was a double feature, but we, none of us made it <laughs> to the second one. I can guarantee you that, but, and they had playgrounds. You could go play and swing on the swings in between while people, you know, just go into the lobby or the hut to get hot dogs, overpriced hot dogs. They weren't so bad then, the prices. Or maybe we just didn't think they were, you know. But uh, I can remember McDonald's hamburger was 10 cents and cheeseburger was 15. Who remembers that? Right? So... I don't know. It's definitely changed. It's not the same. Not just the prices. You, you get my point. So this one is nice. Uh, I love the guy. I love how he tells the story. I love his thoughts about it. I love how he, um, since he was there, he's kind of going with the flow of when is this thing showing up? 
what is it emphasizing? What's its exclamation point on what's going on, you know, when I'm experiencing these things? What is it trying to underline? Is it trying to underline something for us? Or are we doing something that's it's reacting to in, in a way of, is it something we're saying? Is it a point in the play? You know, what is it trying to say? And again, he's not jumping to a lot of conclusions, but I think they're thoughtful. And uh, again, it's done by our friends. Uh, this one is not in the United States. This one happens to be in Canada. Didn't want to forget our friends out there. There's so many in the UK um, and, uh, and around the world. But this one happens to be in Canada. And I don't know uh, if they have a lot of those kind of theaters there. If they experienced the same thing as we did in the um, upswing of all of the different immigrants coming in in the times with their trades and their Art Nouveau and their, their talent and sculpting and these wonderful um, ornate places. It's just they're masterpieces of, of multiple talents coming through in all these different cultures. Um, and it was so important when people came over then that they weren't fleeing their culture, but they acclimated around, you know, like, how did, how are things done here? You know, this is, this is a way I'm going to do it, but I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to keep my culture um, and, and my trade and, and carry that on because that's important. And I think that's an important thing. That's one of these things that the, these theaters say to me, because you look around and you see all that. It's like going into an old house here in in the States would be, you know, a 200-year-old or 175-year-old house. And if they've renovated or kept it correct, I mean, it's an amazing thing. Just a, looking at a staircase or how the, the, the crown molding was done. And imagine, you know, probably a three-generation family uh, going around and making their living doing that or putting together a fireplace or masonry, you know, it's so important. And I think it's important to keep these buildings going. And I think it's important to keep those trades going, you know, um, if you can, I think we're going back to a lot of those things. So anyway, here's a nice story and uh, that's going to take us out tonight. And I think you're going to enjoy it. I love the way he tells it and uh, it'll probably get us cut off because uh, the inner tubes doesn't like it when ghosts, uh, let's say, off themselves. Can we say that? Um, so it, it might not make it to the to the to the replays, but you're going to see it here live if we can. And uh, I hope you enjoy it. I think it's a sweet story, really. It's spooky, but it's a little sweet and sour. How about that? Theatre in London has a fireman, and they're supposed to stay there all night to uh, make sure the place doesn't go up in flames. This is probably a holdover from the 18th century. Whenever the guy was sick, one of us would have to stand in, and you'd have to go on patrol and stuff like that. You get some extra money by staying there all night. I was working in there on a Saturday doing some overtime. There was a microphone, and you could hear everything that happened on the stage. And some nights I'd hear footsteps, and I was convinced I heard voices. Everybody has a past, and so does every building. Its energy can be traumatic, or it can be happy. And every building, just like every person, has baggage. And that history spawns some of the most chilling tales ever. I'm Lawrence Chow. Today we'll meet Ian and Rick, two men who believe they saw firsthand that historic buildings don't just carry baggage, they can carry ghosts. The 1960s, the Cambridge Theater in London's famous West End was still the new kid on a block of century-old playhouses, 40 years old, but with enough history already to have its own ghost. 
I messed up. It, the experience happened in London, but he's telling it in Canada. So two bases, one stone. That's how good we are. <laughs> a total accident. Go ahead. The <laughs> legends. And for young Ian McLean, working around all that history proved to be a terrifying job. When I was younger, I used to see stuff, but I used to immediately dismiss it. But things that you just can't ignore anymore or brush off seemed to come to a head at the Cambridge. I was working in there on a Saturday doing some overtime. Because um, the Cambridge had the lighting console backstage, you had to be very quiet up there because the stage is right there. And I used to sit up there sometimes on some shows when I worked alone up there. And I feel someone pull my clothing. We're actually getting like a yank. It wasn't just a touch, it was a distinct yank on your clothing when I was up there by myself. You know, this is an open area with a ladder that went up to it. So nobody can sneak up and do it. You're up there by yourself. And other times I'd hear people saying, Ian, Ian. Just very quiet, very insistent most of the time, as if they had some huge message to impart to me. hearing things like footsteps and voices when I know the place is empty. But when I used to feel a physical touch, that kind of started getting a bit creepy. And I don't have the kind of excitable imagination that puts up with that. So I usually used to keep it very close to my chest and not broadcast it around. One night when I was walking around on my patrol, there was a back staircase that went from the stage up past the royal box up to the upper circle. I turned a corner in the staircase, and there, standing right in front of me, was this guy. He was standing a couple of stairs up. So he was taller than I was. He had substance but he was like vapor at the same time, but it was like a solid vapor. He had a glow to him. It was the embodiment of all the little tiny suspicions I'd been writing off all this time. The effect it had on me, which was to get the hell out of there. Amazing experience, no? Right, Anna? I mean, what? Now, how many boxes did that tick for you going back and going, yes, I've seen something similar to that. That's how it looked. The way it was, you know, dis dissipated around the edges and, and things like that. You know, the way he's describing it, not really what they're showing because that's the producers and what the show did, but, you know, Interesting, right? I love this. I believe this guy too. I really do. Yeah. Checks all the boxes. <laughs> Frozen's got to check. It's just, it's, just, it's a good story. Absolutely, Kathleen. Totally agree. Yep. Yep. Everything that had happened, I could lay away somewhere. I could say, well, it's, I'm hearing echoes from somewhere else. If it's footsteps or... I'm hearing voices from the street that were picked up by the stage. I got to say, too, so I, I'm sorry I stopped it again, but looking at him walking around the stage, isn't that scary? Imagine you're there all by yourself. You're, you know, you're you're going over your your marks and you're, you know, the person putting out the props or getting the lighting right. Whatever you're doing, you're probably there by yourself or the stage manager. Um, even if you're somebody working on your lines all by yourself. And you're looking around and you can't, if you got the lights on, you can't really see in the seats. You know, maybe it's dark. Maybe it's dark on the stage, too. Look at this guy. He's just walking around with a flashlight. This is spooky stuff, man. This is as spooky as going into an attic of a house or maybe the basement. Or Think about it because you're working yourself up. 
and your energy is starting to go and you know you, your 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 gut is telling you your intuition is telling you that something is there something there's electricity in the air something wicked this way comes you know maybe not wicked as far as negative you know what i mean it's just like something different you know uh is coming nearer and you're getting built up and the adrenaline is starting to go it's uh it's intense microphone but that night when i saw that thing i couldn't make excuses anymore hmm? being confronted by that fellow on the exactly stairs, it was unavoidable i'm trying to think of an analogy it's like when you're on a boat at sea and you're watching a storm coming and you can keep get everything ready being keep avoiding it's only when the thing whacks you that you know you're in a storm that's when you're in a storm when it hits you that's the same as when I came down around those stairs. There was this thing, and there was no avoiding it. There was no avoiding the reality that there was something going on in that theater or around me. Because the National Theater was in there, and it was a repertory company. Each show was different each night. I would have to go up to the lighting console, which is by the side of the stage, make sure everything's preset for that night show. I would need an assistant up there because this thing was like a Hammond organ. You played it with your hands and your feet. I was whispering to this guy, his name was John, during the show, which was Hedda Gabler with Maggie Smith, that sometimes when I'm up there, I feel people saying my name and pulling my clothing. Maggie Smith, terrific actress. And he's up there working at the, they got Maggie Smith on the stage. You know that, that he's a serious at his job or he wouldn't be there. That's, you know, I think about it, just an added bonus for the belief in this guy. You know what I mean? He wouldn't stick his neck out to tell the story. Amazing. And he's giving me the usual. Yeah. Okay. Look right underneath this concrete platform. I used to almost the prompt corner. And that's where you get your instructions from for lighting moves. And the last scene in Hedda Gabler was when Maggie Smith takes a gun from a drawer at the rear stage and walks down to the front of the stage and shoots herself. There's no audio cue from the prompt corner. The cue is the gunshot. And that's my cue to flip this old tab, cause a dead blackout in the theater. When she makes this move, I think the last line she says is, the only cock on the dung heap. And then she walks down to the front of the stage and it takes a few seconds. The place is literally dead silent. You can hear a pin drop in that theater. I can see her out the corner of my eye too, because the stage is to my right, waiting, waiting. She lifts the gun up, and then from behind this lighting console comes a sound. The sound came from directly behind this lighting console, and there's nothing there. There's a wall that goes straight up. It's like the guy or whatever it was was lying back there. I just didn't know what it was. I literally didn't have a clue what it could be. And as it grew louder and louder, I think I thought to myself, oh, geez, here we go again. It's something else. I think subconsciously I thought, well, at least I've got witnesses now to this mom because he just can't ignore it. Yeah, there's something around here and it's not very benign. I think everybody knew what they heard wasn't man-made. It wasn't somebody goofing around. It was something so otherworldly that nobody could come to any other conclusion. Most of Ian's experiences fall into the category of poltergeist activity. Reports of similar events date all the way back to 530 AD. Experts don't always agree about what causes them, 
but they do agree that poltergeist activity is violently dramatic. If there are such noisy spirits, they'd be right at home in a theater. Jim. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> oh, I love the smiling guy. It's creepy. Creepy, but I love it. Yep. Oh. Cute ghost in hand. Pet ghost. Ghosts are not pets, everybody. Don't forget it. Pass it along. Okay. <laughs> All right. It's a great story, though, right? That's profound. Now, my first thought, well, maybe not first, but listening to him say it, first off, I believe him. Second of all, if I agree with you guys, it sounds better than English accent. Oh, it always does. It's wonderful. A little spookier. And it made me think that one night we're going to do a Peter Underwood night. He's got these wonderful little things he's left behind and uh, radio interviews that go way, 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 way back. And tells these wonderful stories in this wonderful, and it's not just the accent; it's it's the it's the mood, it's the 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 feel, it's the uh, the je ne sais quoi. Say, you know, there, there's there's something to it. There's an air, you know, when he speaks, and he's so matter of fact about stuff. Like uh, not too long ago, I played the one where Peter Underwood and his assistant left camera uh and and something else on the steps of a haunted place and came back and they had a recording you know it's looking at me it's looking at us remember and he just says it i'll be back my name is peter underwood and i'll be back next week you know cheerio or whatever and it's just this air it's very cool so we'll do a night of those uh they're just they're gold they're absolute gold um but this guy it, it, the feel reminds me of him and uh, to see that uh, he was there for, as he said, you know, not too long, but, you know, a couple of years, worked on a lot of plays. Um, now, did it have something to do with what was going on the stage? Did it have something to do with think about the time? OK, I think it would be very quick for us to say. Throw out a thought out there of. OK. She's going out there and she's committing suicide. Is this a, perhaps a ghost that committed suicide in the theater? Is there any history on that? Um, maybe trying to stop them by screaming almost in their way. No, it's possible. Something deeper might be thought of as she's walking, as he, the way he describes it, He's held in suspense. He's waiting for the moment to flip the switch. She's doing her dramatic. It's Maggie Smith. You know, drama. She she drips drama as she walks. I mean, she's just, you know, like Marilyn drips sex when she walked. You, you feel what I'm saying? It's true. So Maggie is doing her. She's in this crescendo of her moment she's walking the stage she's looking at the gun she says her line you know the last cock on the heap or whatever which goes back it's in shakespeare and a couple other things i don't know off the top of my head but i know there's several others it was a saying meaning it's like yeah you're top dog you're the last one left but you're standing on a pile of shit it's a joke you know you might take it differently but that's my interpretation because that's what she's kind of saying. It's like, you know, I, I, I don't know the play, but just think it's a, it's a dramatic moment. The crowd is there. They're right there with her. She's taking every single damn one of them with her. even the popcorn guy stop scooping popcorn, just go and waiting for that moment. The staff, everybody, that whole place is filled with that kind of energy. 
Was it the moment because of what she was doing or was it the moment because there was so much energy in this whatever was just trying to be noticed and caught up in that energy? I, you know, I wouldn't want to jump to conclusion, you know, quick and say, well, they committed suicide. What if it's the guy who fell off the ladder or the guy that somebody was on the land before? And it's just such a powerful presence that it has not given up. Pardon upon the ghost. You know, I wonder if that if that's where it comes from. He hasn't given up the ghost. We'll have to dig into that and see. There's another rabbit hole to dig down. The origin of that one is. But anyway, very interesting story. Very profound uh, experiences. All of them really tonight, I thought, were. Um, and I think also the place and the atmosphere of these old theaters are profound. And I think they would be excellent um, places to go and respectfully um, investigate. You know, because my God, if the if those velvet chairs could talk, if those balconies could speak... You know, if those red velvet gauche, uh, highly uh, expensive curtains with the, the gold fringe, the kind that Carol Burnett used to make that dress in her parody of uh, uh, Gone with the Wind it was hysterical. I mean, she had the, 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 she had the curtain rod across her shoulders and she had the amulets on her, and the hat, the twist of the hat. It was crazy. They don't make them like Carol Burnett anymore. People think they're like Carol Burnett, but honey, mm -mm -mm. You, ain't, you ain't you ain't fit to pull on her ear. If she did it, she did it in a in a time where women weren't doing it, and um, broke a lot of ceilings. And great crew, you know, that was a good show, good variety show. It was kind of like vaudeville at its best, which started in most of these theaters. So I just think it's very interesting. The places are interesting. The acoustics, the, you know, the decor, uh, the way people are, the um, the stories of the, you know, the projectionists that, you know, started when they just started doing silent uh, movies, maybe made it all the way up to, you know, some of the more modern ones, you know, and did it all in that room. And all he asked for was a candy bar and a, you know, in the soda. And that was a good story about how they tried to do the, you know, a more modern showing or something like that. And they had forgot and the thing wouldn't work until they went down and got a candy bar and a soda and put it there. And then everything worked again. Coincidence, you know, interesting. Some people that work these jobs like janitors and, um, you know, management or actresses whatever they they just hang on and some of these places gosh can you think uh they're so beautiful i just hope that they get to see them last and not destroyed and disrespected and, and things like that so if you've got one that might be an interesting thing you go if you got a you're lucky enough to have a little downtown and it's got a little old theater and you know maybe get involved with that and you know, whether you, you're in the drama or the music or, you know, you got a band, start a festival. People love that kind of stuff. Make something up. Just get people together and keep the lights on because I think those are good places for that. Meets the hell out of, you know, every two hours somebody watching Saw or, you know, Purge or some of these other crazy things. You know, what happened to True Grit and, you know, The Longest Day and, Get, you know, gosh, to kill a mockingbird and, and some of these, that's Harvey. Arsenic and old lace, you like murder? There's plenty of murder in that. You know, <laughs> it's crazy. It was the last time you saw Arsenic and old lace. Such a great, great movie. There's so much going on in that movie. Just, you know, th these people were crazy, but they weren't crazy like we're seeing today. You know, this is, this is high frequency, crazy stuff going on you know and i'm sure people were you know just we, we kept our crazy but you know uh we had the southern approach with our crazy you know we just kind of kept them around the house and oh god it's comedy gold jack it is you know and uh the the, the dude who thought he was uh uh gonna go up san juan hill uh 
Roosevelt, right? Teddy thought he was Teddy with the bugle. And he'd go around and give everybody orders and stuff. And old ladies burying bodies in the cellar. <laughs> oh, this is great. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. You know. So, yeah. You know, maybe, you know, go down and save your, your local old theater. And, you know, whether you can set up, watch that movie. Do a screening of that. Do a screening of something, you know, and sit down and... Take your grandkids and the neighborhood neighbor's kids with their permission, I'm sure. If you'd want to be around uh, somebody of that age right now, might do them some good, you know. But, uh, yeah, these theaters, save them if you can. Uh, get involved if you can. I'd, I'd like to. I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's terrible when they get torn down. I'll never forget the day my mom was talking about it. I mean, she literally, she was in the paper back then. A lot of people got the news from the newspaper and I remember her reading it and, and she kind of grabbed the kitchen table and sat down. And then she told me some stories about being there and the, the feeling the, 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 the material on the chairs and looking at all the ornate stuff and appreciating it. And, um, pretty cool. So I hope you get a chance to do that. And if not, you're going to see some more tomorrow. Uh, I hope to see you back here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Namaste, blessings, and uh, everything else. And I promise you it will be used for exactly what you want it to be used for. Um, just me researching and finding these great stories. We learned some for each one of them uh, tonight, something different. And there's a lot more uh, across America and, and out there, you know, probably in a neighborhood near you. I hope you have a haunted theater. If so, go in there and tell that ghost they have a choice because yeah, it's not probably always going to be standing. And that's kind of sad when everything changes too much. I love you guys. You've been great. What do you want to hear going out? Do you want some, do you want some skeleton fairy? Ted, are you still here, honey? And Edna, skeleton fairy. I think you guys deserve it. And I'll see you tomorrow night. Uh, Mr. Steve Stockton will be here. And do, 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 if I can find it, what do we got? What do we got? And we are going to, he's got some good stories he wants to share. I got so many videos. It's hard to find this stuff. Bear with me. Do, 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 do. God, I had to clean out my computer. Isn't it funny? 50 years ago, I probably would have said I got to clean out the refrigerator or thaw out the freezer. Times have changed. All right. I can't find Scott. Well, well, yes, I can. Here we go. I love you all. Yeah. <laughs> Ladybug stories. That was so funny. Oh, my God. His, his dad opening that up. And all of those, the homing, homing ladybugs. When I thought of that, I cracked up. Because what a sad, sad. Um, good night, Uncommon Belief. Love you. Ted, Sarah, Renice, Jack, Vic Sindo, and Edna, everybody. Thank you for your kindness tonight. Thank you for supporting this show. Um, again, I think about it all the time. Like I want to reach out to certain great shows, but they have so many um, commercials in between. And they may not know, they may not realize that they can cut those out of the middle. I can't do that to you guys. Because if we're listening, if you can get past the inane drone of my voice, you know, and you're trying to hear a story and you're slowly going to sleep, you know, or listening to Steve's story or something else. We're telling, you know, whatever it may be. And then you get this annoying blast of idiot box crap, you know, and it's a commercial and it's, you know, uh, I hate that. But so many shows put those on and charge for extra content. stuff. look, I'm lucky I get can work all this out working and doing everything else I got to do to, to put in the right time and research and try to give you truthful information, even though I mess up a lot, you know, but we figure it out together. Um, so I appreciate you appreciating me and I appreciate you being here and something to look forward to in the week and something, you know, I get excited. I'm like, what do you, you know, people at work ask me, what are you doing this week? I'm doing sharks, you know, uh, what are you doing? Axe murders. They're all scared of me. You know, it's like axe murders. She knows more. She knows exactly how long it takes to strangle a human being. And I'm like, 
it's not because I do it every day. It's because I mean true crime and everything else. I pay attention. It's not like I'm going to, you know. But you can't help them. If somebody says something, you know, silly or, and you know they're wrong about how quick it is to, you know, do something like that. No, man, that's a, that takes a, you gotta, you gotta want that shit. You know, you gotta be in there for the whole, you know, that's close up and personal. It's like stabbing, you know, but when you say stuff like that, it's not because, <laughs> you know what I mean? I, you know, it's creepy, but, um, uh, not in a bad, it, 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 you know, we're just learning to prevent it and learning to, to sort things. And it just seems like I said, the paranormal, well, the, well, we're talking to the dead people, where are your questions? You know, they got that way somehow, you know, whether it's intentional or accident or otherwise, you know, oh, but you people are just so, so dark, you're dark. You know, you just, that's just, oh, Okay. Right, you just got to blow that stuff off. You know, sometimes you have to dip. You, you have to get walk through the darkness to appreciate the light and to make it stronger. And once you understand how strong the light is, the darkness just isn't that strong anymore, is it? There you go. So, with that being said, Mister the GIF artist, Mister Kislowski. And the wonderful music of Mr. Bolger. I give to you the Skeleton Fairy. I love you all.